Welcome to The Real News Network. I'm Paul Jay. The military budget that's been presented by the Trump administration and the Pentagon, which raises military spending to a pretty much unheard of, seven, over $760 billion. And that's actually, in reality, much more than that, because there's certain parts of the defense structure that don't show up within the Pentagon budget. Many people estimate that even before this uh, rise in military budget, the real military spending was over a trillion dollars. But in any case, this is a significant rise. Uh, Patrick Shanahan, who's the uh, acting uh, Secretary of Defense, has been quoted as telling his staff that when you're defending the military budget and the logic behind this budget, you only need three words, China, China, and China. This massive military budget is being justified and in the thinking of the Pentagon is because there's going to be an inevitable collision between the United States and China. And the answer of the United States is overwhelming military force in order to maintain global hegemony. They may not use the word hegemony, but they use language pretty close to that. Uh, in the most recent copy of the magazine Foreign Affairs, uh, it's, the title is, Who Will Rule the World? Uh, United States, China, and global order, the global order, and they have various people writing about this. Uh, this isn't new. The idea that the ultimate uh, geopolitical game is between the U.S. and China. Uh, and as I say, the answer of the uh, empire, American empire, is to make it such that even in Asia, uh, where China, one would think, would have a certain amount of sway, the uh, United States will not give up its uh, position of uh, what they consider dominance in the region. Now joining us to talk about this is Gerald Horn. Gerald teaches history at the University of Houston. He's the author of many books, including Storming the Heavens and The Apocalypse of Settler Colonialism. Thanks for joining us again, Gerald. Thank you. So, as I say, it's not new, but this new military budget and the language about China is getting far more overt. Uh, the Trump administration, uh, Bannon, Steve Bannon, uh, talked about the uh, real strategy of the United States really being focused on China more than anything. Uh, there's a lot of talk about, you know, tensions with Russia. And perhaps one of the reasons the Trump administration wanted to diminish uh, some of those tensions with Russia is because for them it really is all about China. Uh, is this collision inevitable? I hope not, because it would be quite ominous and dangerous. Recall that Graham Ellison of Harvard has published a book entitled Destined for War, and the two parties supposedly destined for war are precisely the United States and China. N note that with this trade war that Mr. Trump has launched against China, with the attempt to bring Huawei, the Chinese telecommun telecommun telecommunications giant, to its knees, by making sure that the Canadians detain their chief financial officer in Vancouver, British Columbia, the United States has ratcheted up tensions with China. And just today, that is to say Monday, March 18th, there is a striking editorial in the Wall Street Journal, which suggests that one of the reasons why the United States is putting pressure on Venezuela is because there is a perception that this will be a route to pressure South American nations to back away from China. Singled out for attack as the president of Colombia, who is headed this week to China in order to seek financing for his nation. The United States and the Wall Street Journal think that that's a bad idea. Interestingly enough, the so-called Trump of the tropics, speaking of Mr. Bolsonaro of Brazil, is headed to the White House this week. China is one of the major trading partners of Brazil. And there is the idea that Mr. Trump will put pressure on Mr. Bolsonaro to wreck or curb that particular economic and commercial relationship. So just like the Cold War with the former Soviet Union, you see that Washington is putting on a full court press or perhaps a full planet press with regard to its approach to China. Yeah, when Tillerson was Secretary of State uh, talking about China and Latin America, uh, Tillerson invoked the Monroe Doctrine, 
and talk directly about pushing China out of Latin America as, as, as if the United States has special rights to Latin America and China will have to respect that. Of course, that doesn't mean China has any special rights in Asia. Well, what's interesting as well is the response of the Democratic Party. Uh, I used to live and teach in Hong Kong, and I still listen to Hong Kong Radio, which is a special administrative region of the People's Republic of China. And just yesterday, uh, some of the spokespersons from the mainland were complaining that if you don't like Trump's approach to China, you'll dislike the Democratic Party's approach to China even more, not least when it comes to trade. And you can already tell that the Democratic Party will be attacking Trump from the right, no matter how this trade situation with China unfolds. Similarly, there's a critique of Mr. Trump because instead of enlisting the European Union in a united front to go up against China, Mr. Trump is putting pressure on Germany and the European Union in particular, and the Democratic Party elites see that as a failed strategy. It's unclear how this will all shake out in the end. The uh, Chinese hold an enormous amount of American uh, treasury bills. Uh, by memory, I think it's over a trillion dollars, uh, which is a, a significant amount in terms of the Chinese GDP. Uh, the two economies are very intertwined. The amount of American production that goes on in China, Apple, of course, is the most famous, but there's many companies producing in China to take advantage of the cheap labor and send the goods back to the United States. But increasingly, the Chinese market is incredibly important to American companies. Again, Apple's a very good example. And in fact, you know, in the long run, the Chinese market is the biggest market by far in the world, as spending power seems to be going up in China. The population's enormous. Uh, you seem to have this kind of two-track thing going on here. On the side of the economy, a lot of interpenetration, a lot of necessary collaboration. They may have, you know, uh, fights over a balance of payments and things like this, but the e fundamental economic relationship is so intertwined. But on the geopolitical, geostrategic level, the military level, another logic, uh, which is that there's a point at which the United States will, will use this force to literally stop China. Uh, that seems to be the language, or is it all BS? And is this rising threat of China a way to spend a ton of money and make a lot of money for American arms manufacturers? Well, certainly it's the latter. I mean, Boeing, which is Mr. Shanahan's former employer, is smiling all the way to the bank, not least because they're bound to suffer lo losses because of these crashes in Indonesia and Ethiopia. In some ways, however, the relationship between China and the United States right now reminds me of the scene from the Hollywood movie Reservoir Dogs, where the two major characters point guns at each other, and it's unclear which one will blink first. Certainly, as a result of Mr. Trump's ham-fisted approach to China, you have farmers, particularly in the electorally important Midwest, singing the blues, not least because of the curb on soybean sales, which... China has been making up by buying them not only from Brazil, but interestingly enough, increasingly uh, from Russia. But also, if you look even not too deeply at Mr. Trump's approach to China, it's apparent that a number of U.S. multinationals are being asked to take a haircut. I'm speaking of Apple, whose slowdown in profits has a lot to do with the fact that Chinese consumers are buying fewer iPhones, which helps to explain why Apple is now investing more heavily in a territory that Netflix now dominates. I'm speaking of scripted television and movies and all, and all of the rest. Uh, Starbucks, for example, is getting more competition in China, which is a major locus of its profit making, not only from a Chinese competitor, but also uh, from Costa, which started off in the UK and was bought by Coca-Cola. However, it's unclear whether or not these US corporations will keep making profits in China when the relationship between Beijing and Washington is headed southward. Uh, I, I, have to, I have to invite some military minds on the panel to, to educate me, because there, there, other than money making, I don't get the logic. So you have this massive increase in the American military prowess. They use the word making the armed forces more lethal. Uh, 
I don't know what the hell that means, because everything they had already killed a lot of people. So how do you, how do you get more lethal? But anyway, they, in their defense documents, that phrase keeps appearing. But they're going to have a, a couple of uh, big aircraft carriers, Ford-class uh, aircraft carriers, which cost about $14 billion a piece. There's a plan for almost a dozen of them. Uh, new fighter jets, uh, a couple of billion for space war. But how do you use any of this? Like, if you're going to, quote, unquote, fight the Chinese, the Chinese aren't fighting by creating bases everywhere. They're not fighting because there's going to be Chinese troops. There's no way that the American armed forces can have some direct fight with the Chinese armed forces, even over Taiwan. They can talk about it, but if it ever came to that, what can the U.S. really do? Uh, th there's a point where these armies are both so big, so uh, lethal, both sides, that once something begins, it either it ends in nuclear war. Like, the, how do you start? You know, can't have a limited all-out war. So the logic of this whole defense budget, it, it seems that there isn't any, which leads you to the point. I, I mean, when I interviewed Ellsberg, I asked him, you know, all the modernization of the nuclear weaponry that's going on. Uh, I think it's uh, something in the way of realm of $30 billion over the next uh, 30 years, but most of it's going to be spent in the next 10 years. So Russia's spending the same amount of money. Interesting enough, Ellsberg says the Chinese are not joining in this. Uh, the Chinese are building enough to have a deterrent, but they're not building a great big stockpile. Uh, but there's a point where you, there's nothing you can do with more because what you've got already ends life on Earth. So it winds up being what? Mon about money making. Well, that, number one. But also keep in mind that a simple robber oftentimes has a very nice weapon, not necessarily because the robber wants to use the weapon. The robber wants to intimidate a person in order to get that person to turn over their riches willingly. And so likewise, I think that that is the prism through which you should view this military buildup. That is to say, to threaten and intimidate China, not necessarily to use these weapons, and in conjunction with a like military budget uh, rise that's going to take place in Japan and Australia, and then trying to enlist India as well into this cabal. India, as you know, has very complicated relations with China going back to the 1962 border clash between the two nations. And if you add all of those factors together, you'll get an idea that the ultimate purpose is a shakedown of China, an intimidation of China. And hopefully, at least I'm hoping, that the Pentagon is not intending war, which could mean the extinction of all humanity. And I don't see the shakedown working. I mean, I agree. That's, that's the logic of it. But I think it's, it's so far-fetched that they're actually going to intimidate China that it, I get back to the point of it's, it's a narrative in order to throw, uh, I used the phrase before, shower money on the Pentagon and all the contractors. Anyway, I'm sure we'll talk more about this. Thanks very much for joining us, Joe. Thank you. And thank you for joining us on The Real News Network.